Martial artist is not just somebody who studies martial arts, you know. Good day to you. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and this is episode 284. Today, we're joined by Mr. Larry Sikafus. If you haven't been lately, please head on over to whistlekick.com. Check out the new stuff we've got going on there. Check out the links to all the other projects that we work on day in, day out. Martial arts calendar, martial arts memes. Follow us on social media or head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com and check out one of the other 283 other episodes, all available for free going back several years now. You can find the show notes with links to the guests' social media or websites, sometimes email addresses, phone numbers, videos, personal photos. We really do our best to make those show notes supplemental to what you hear on the show words are great we love the podcast format but sometimes you're looking for a little more it's nice to know what our guests look like how they move in some of the videos links to the things we talk about books movie recommendations and that's why we have show notes so check those out let's talk about today though today's guest Mr. Larry Zikafus transcends many generations of martial artists as a longtime martial arts veteran. He's always claimed his father as a major influence, and even though his father's path isn't the one we think of when we generally talk about martial arts being handed down to a child, it's just as relevant, just as powerful. With over 50 years of training, today's guest now shares his knowledge with the younger generations. Talking to him was fun with stories from humble beginnings to passionate training, and so much more. Let's welcome him. Mr. Sikafus, welcome to Whistle Take Martial Arts Radio. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks for being here. Look forward to our chat. Yeah. So we were just talking a little bit, listeners, you know, most of the time we have a little bit of what I call pre-show, where we're just kind of chatting a little bit. And, and you know, you are, are yet another person that we've got on from the mid-atlantic it, you know when we talk about martial arts you know there are certainly the these hot spots but it seems like there's a decent amount of martial arts down your way but maybe it's just not discussed on a on a national level as often yeah i think uh there's a lot of martial arts schools in this you know i'm in a greater cincinnati area actually i mean even though it's, it's northern kentucky there's a lot of martial arts schools here i think uh None of them that, that I know to get national uh, coverage. Uh, we do have one instructor down here, uh, Master Kim, with you know martial arts in Erlanger, Kentucky. Now I don't think he's actually a uh, Olympic qualified instructor or referee. So oh, wow. he's been he's in his eighties now. And he's been here forever. You know. Yeah, but, but of course, when we go back, you know, when we when we talk about martial arts in the 60s the 50s 60s and, and, the, and the 70s the landscape seemed to be a little bit different about where people were you know bill wallace coming out of indiana and, and that being kind of a hotbed and then texas being a hotbed for martial arts and for competition and now it's it's kind of it, it seems like at least attention wise it's shifted more towards the coasts and just I, I find that fascinating you know i, I have no idea why that happened, but at least that's where the, the attention is. I guess most of the Koreans and Japanese and Chinese people in the martial arts, most of them probably immigrated into the West Coast, and then, like you said, move into Texas, and you know, the coast get most traffic, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course, we're here to talk martial arts, so let's talk about martial arts in, in your time in the martial arts, and why don't we rewind the whole way and how about you tell us how you got started? <clears throat> well, I was raised in West Virginia, and uh, I've always had an interest in martial arts. I guess I bought my first Black Belt magazine. I must have been 10 years old. And I saved up to buy it. And I was always interested in it. I took my first martial arts training with a judo training when I was 17. This, now I'm 67 years old now, so we're talking 50 years ago. 
And uh, like you say, I buy Black Belt magazines, and all the schools are listed in the back. We're all California, and New York, Texas, you know, nowhere, anywhere near me. But uh, I was always interested in it. Uh, I think I bought my first karate book, as they called them, when I was probably 10. But uh, I was, I've been in and out of martial arts for my entire life. Whenever I could afford it or whenever I was on a, wasn't on a, a ship to prevent it, I was didn't care what style it was. If there was someone near me, I'd go down and I'd work out with them or try to take some lessons. Uh, it's been that way in my, well, my entire life. So, uh, mm. Now, you said ship. Were, were you in the service? Yeah, I was in the service just for a little while, and uh, that's nothing special there. Uh, now, when I got out of the service, I was in Washington, D.C. area. And uh, June Rhea, I think we used an interview June Rhea. I went into one of his schools. Down. I, was, I worked right around the corner from his main school at that time. was at 2000 L Street. And uh, a couple of guys I worked with actually trained with him. I, went, I actually met him one time. But, uh, he, he was well known for his commercials down there. You know. but, uh, so I studied a little show to calm down there. But then again, my, my shift would change. And, and uh, then I'd have to drop it. There wasn't no, too many schools had classes during the day because it was usually, you know, the instructors had a regular job, you know. Yeah. June Reed was pretty well known down. He trained senators and everything. Matter of fact, I think his health is bad right now. It is. It is. He uh, <clears throat> he wasn't doing so well when we had him on the show, which I was I was honored that he was willing to take the time. But he... Uh, yeah, him yeah, and uh, he's, he's a legend. Most, most of the instructors in the D.C. area and, and Taekwondo, that area at that time, I'm talking 70s now, uh, came with him or, you know, were in a river group. I mean, there was one in Falls Church, Virginia at the time named Quan Ro. Uh, and uh, he had originally came with uh, was in a group with uh, June Rhee. And it was, there was a master course, there always is a master Kim down there. Uh, they were all the old schools. Yeah. Yeah, it, and I've wondered if some of the reason for for the heavy density of Taekwondo in the D.C. area relates at all to international politics. I don't know if you've read um, the book A Killing Art. No, I don't believe so. But, you know, there's some interesting stuff in there that that... You know, it, it comes up on the show from time to time. the The idea that Taekwondo for Korea was, you know, a, a political tool as much as a sport, and some of the things that spidered out from that with the Korean equivalent of the CIA. And, and there's some amazing stories. And um, Alex Gillis is the author, and he's been on the show, and he, he talked a bit about his process and researching and writing that book. Fascinating stuff. Yeah, they had some major tournaments down there. I know that uh, June Rhee and the others put on. Oh, yeah. I think they had an international championships down there one year, around 68, 69, something like that. Where, did you go to those? Did you compete? I didn't compete. No, I, I would go and watch them whenever I could. Me and my wife would load up and go. And I uh, always enjoyed watching them. Sometimes, you know... Uh, You'd see major entertainers would be competing in them, you know, in different styles. I remember there was a show on back in the '60s called uh, it was uh, the Rebel. Nick Adams was the actor who starred, and he, he deceased. Uh, I was surprised to see him down there one time competing in a judo tournament. I think. I found out he was a, he was a, and of course Robert Culp was uh, very active in martial arts. Uh, Bill Cosby. Uh, of course, Elvis Presley was was in there. Sure. But, uh, so a lot of those people would, uh, you know, when they come to this tournament in D.C. area, people, a lot of people go to, I'll go to watch martial arts and seeing the entertainers was just uh, a sidebar. But a lot of people went mainly just to see what entertainers were in these competitions. You know. Have you been to competitions more more recently? I'm curious of the differences because, of course, I, I I wasn't able to attend any competitions back then. I haven't been to any major competition. You know, the old style of competition, like we're talking about the big tournaments, you don't see a lot of them anymore. And from what instructors tell me, it's getting to be a problem with insurance, but I don't know. But, uh, you don't see a lot of the big ones. I used to, I went to a couple as a spectator. Uh, 
I had a relative involved in it in Charleston, West Virginia. Now, this is, again, this is in the 70s. Uh, there were full contact matches. Uh, this before any of the, you know, they had just very minimal protective gear yeah. and a lot of knockouts, you know. People, people today don't realize that had happened that early, you know. <laughs> And then the PKA originally, you know, that that made television, you know. You don't see a lot of the big tournaments like that anymore. No, we've got some bigger ones now, but they're not, they, they don't seem to have the same, I guess, cultural impact. You know, you yeah. talked about not being a competitor, but still packing up the car with your wife and driving to a competition. And that's not... That's not something you hear terribly often now. If someone's attending a tournament, they they usually have a a good reason to be there. There's a person, whether it's somebody, oh. whether they're competing or somebody that they care about is competing. You know, uh, just I've just been that way, like I said, all my life. You know, I've watched martial arts. You know, and if I'm not going to watch it, participate in it, or anything to do with martial arts, I've always been interested in it. What does that stem from? <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm not, I can't really say. Uh, I had an interest in, of course, like any other kid watching it on TV, you'd see all this, the stuff, and I always was amazed with it. And uh, I, like I say, I buy books and stuff, and I always wish I could train. And then uh, found out that what I needed was standing in the next room. Uh, my father was served in a pretty elite airborne unit during the Second World War. And uh, I found out he was... <laughs> I've never found anybody to this day that I think was has, could teach me more about close quarter hand to hand combat than he did. It took a little prodding to get him to do it, but once uh, then for the rest of my life, you know, any time you know I needed advice on so even on a technique, I could always go to him, and you know he taught me more than all the instructors in the world. But you know there, that was my interest, and then you know. And like I say, when I hit 17, they actually had a martial arts training at a local college. Uh, a judo class was started, uh, which had a had a little guy look like Mr. Clean, uh, who was a janitor at the college. And uh, a real quiet guy, didn't say much. He's sweeping up the gym, from what I understand. And one of the college football players thought they'd have a little fun, so they ran up and grabbed him from behind. Well, this guy was a black belt in judo trained in japan and was all a korean war vet still a little, little bit of combat shot going on and you know they, they took him a few days to get this football player back on his feet and uh, it, it took uh they said it took about a year to talk about actually teaching judo so uh, we were fortunate to train under him so wow. now you mentioned that you've train pretty much wherever you could, you know, a variety of different styles. Yeah. And I find that there's a bit of a difference in perspective from those who have trained in a bunch of different styles, especially if it's small chunks versus someone who's trained at, you know, one school under one instructor for several decades. What do you think you gained and what do you think you lost by being, well, let's say, diversified? Uh what you gain, I think, is just the uh, perspective of you know. There's, there's more than one way that you know to do something. Uh, the different styles, you know. That uh, when people ask me about being a martial artist. I always say, you know, if you're going to be a well-rounded martial artist, if that's what your really objective is to be, you have definitely got to understand distance, uh, and you see that in different styles. Uh, you know, you got a sparring distance of uh, taekwondo. And then you got, you know, you take a step forward, now you're boxing distance. Uh, take another step forward, and now you're inside his guard at a, you know, where things start getting ugly with knees and elbows, and, uh, and you're in stand up grappling. And then again, you, next you have ground fighting. And, mm. You know, there's different techniques, different weapons as far as kicking and punching, and then the lower kicks and closer punches. And it's just uh, completely, and you got to be able to, to work at all those distances and the different arts, you know, in uh, in some of the Japanese arts versus Taekwondo, you know, you're, you're much closer in sparring. Uh, Taekwondo, of course, emphasizes kicks. Uh, 
you know, you can watch Taekwondo sparring for an hour and never see a punch. But uh, and, and you go to something like Shotokan or uh, other Japanese styles, you'll see more punching. You'll see a lot of good kicking, but you'll, you'll see more punching. And, and of course, Judo and Hapkido, Hapkido, those are you know, classifications of their own. They're actually, I guess, considered grappling arts. The cultural things. Uh, I got uh, I got a cousin who's a master in Taekwondo, and uh, I studied Taekwondo for a while under a Korean instructor. But he's, he's a Korean instructor, and uh, they're a little touchy about that. You know, he, he talked one time to the instructor about taking a, uh, a different art at another school at the same time. Of course, the Korean immediately, do you think you know everything there is to know about Taekwondo? He says, well, of course not. He says. And why do you need to go somewhere else? You know, that's just they just their culture. There's their cultural difference, or they you know they expect dedication. You know, and you know, well, you don't offend them. They could be offended about things like that. Or the, the students today are different than they were back then too. They're they're more consumers than students. You know, they expect something for their money. And their their attitude is completely different. That might be the best summary. You know, it's a, it's a subject that comes up on the show, and we talk about the differences between then and now, the old school and the new school, however you want to term it. But using that word consumer, that that makes a lot of sense. I think that sums it up pretty tightly. Yeah, you know, you have the old instructors, you know, the, the, it's, it's really sensitive to a lot of students now when an instructor says, you know, I need you to teach this class, you know, you need to start giving back. You know, that used to be pretty common, you'd hear that. But, you know, students, I've heard students today say, give back what? You know, I didn't get one lesson here I didn't pay for, you know. How much money am I going to give back? Are you going to give back? You know, they, you know, they, they don't mind helping, but they don't like, they, they seem more sensitive to if you, if you say to, that they have some type of an obligation to do that. And it wasn't even, back in the old days, it wasn't even an obligation. It's more a tradition, you know. But, uh, but some people, you know, I guess some people just abuse it. But, but they look at it more as, you know, I'm a consumer. I'm paying for these lessons. What am I getting? You know, I've seen uh, I was, I've seen people take uh, quit schools and stuff because of the way the training was going. Uh, I worked out in one school that cardio was really emphasized. It was, you know, you'd be soaking wet before you'd done any martial arts just from the cardio. And uh, they lost students over that. Said, you know, I'm, if I'm on cardio, I'll go to the damn gym. You know, uh, I'm not paying for cardio. I'm paying to, for this particular martial art, and that's what I want to learn. You know, it's, uh, they, you know they just thought was, that wasn't what they were they were purchasing. You know, mm. purchasing. Yeah. No, you've kind of got my 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 gears turning a little bit because with with that term gives me a different perspective because. I have to try to empathize with that approach because that's not me, and I'm going to guess that that's not you. Yeah. Right. To me, martial arts is a lifestyle. I think to most of the folks listening to us talk right now, martial arts is a lifestyle. Yeah, it's you know, and you don't, you know, for us old timers, that is really different. You know, if I, if I say, you know, that this is John, he's a, he's a martial artist. So I call you a martial artist. I've given you one of the best compliments. I know how to give you. You know, martial artist is not just somebody who studies martial arts. You know, like you say, there's a whole philosophy, a whole lifestyle behind that. It's a matter of integrity and, and, and courtesy, and uh, you don't see a lot of that anymore. You know. Yeah. My dad, you say anybody can get a can give a, get a black belt, but not everybody can be a black belt. You know. You said your dad said that. Yeah, he said that, you know, he was he was interested, you know, he always, he, he understood martial arts and didn't even realize, he was a martial artist and didn't even realize it, you know, his philosophies and stuff. Oh, but interesting. The, uh, the training he had, I, you know, I was like, I, I, I can't talk martial arts without talking about him. When I got to my black belt in combat of keto, uh, he said, "What well, they teach you?" And I just laughed because he was still alive then. Uh, he was in a, a VA hospital. I said, "Dad, the stuff that I, that I had to know to test for black belt at the black belt level were things you taught me when I was nine years old." And I, I have never been able to find out who trained these guys. I mean, this is 1942, you know. 
you know, the Taekwondo didn't exist under that name. I don't think Aikido or uh, Aikido, you know, everything was basically Aiki Jiu-Jitsu. Right. And uh, like you say, everything was on the coast. And I, you know, I've actually researched and tried to find who trained these guys uh, in Tacoa, Georgia. But, uh, they were trained well. I tell, <laughs> tell us a little bit about that time with your father as a child. Oh, my father was a coal miner. Uh, uh, just trying to work and raise his family. Uh, we would work out and exercise and wrestle, you know. I mean, uh, out in the yard one time when I was taking judo, of course, I had to try it out on Dad. So we were out in the yard, we're out in the yard because we got to, I got big enough, we were starting to break up furniture, and Mom was going to whip both of us. So, so we're out in the yard and, and you know, and locked up, you know, in a, what they call Red Dory, the judo. And, uh, we're locked, yeah, and uh, we're locked up, and I threw it, and he got up, said it's pretty good, and he grinned. Now, when he grinned, I should have took off running. At that <laughs> but, uh, and if you can picture it, so we lock up again, and he takes his right arm and knocks my left arm down, straight down, and at the same time throws an elbow. And unfortunately, when he moved, I moved, and I moved towards him which means I caught the elbow at full force, and he dropped me like a sack of rocks, you know. So, <laughs> and I always laughed and said, I'm doing sports judo, and this guy's still at the Battle of the Bulge. You know? <laughs> so I'm at a great disadvantage here. <laughs> and, uh, well, I was on a wrestling team in high school, and uh, of course I had to try that out. And if you've ever done any of that type of wrestling, there's, there's a lock called a cradle. We got him under the, under the, they're on their back, and I got him one arm under his neck, and I got his legs pulled up, and I got my hands locked, which is it's called a cradle because of his position, which is a, a good penning hole. You know, in that, in that sport you're trying to pin their shoulders. So I got him, I got my legs spread out, and I got weighted on him, and, you know, I got him now. And he sticks his thumb in my eye. <laughs> <laughs> Now we're jumping into France, I guess. I <laughs> but, you know, that's, it's a different, yeah, and, and that's why I, I have mainly stayed with arts like uh, judo and Hapkido. I was taking Taekwondo and, uh, you know, the self-defense you taught in Taekwondo is usually based on one style of Hapkido. It's Korean art. Uh, Sin Mu, I think, is the one that you mostly use. But when I took my first Hapkido class, uh, self-defense and taekwondo, I thought, okay, now I'm at home. Now this is what I'm looking for, you know. And, you know, I, I would do the taekwondo, I'd do all the other arts, you know, whenever I could. But that's the type of art that uh, I liked. And I was out of the, out for a while, out of martial arts for a while, in bad physical condition. I said, I got to do something. So then I seen combat Hapkido. And I said, oh, let, me, let me go look this up. So I took my daughter along and didn't tell them I had any martial arts experience at all. I'm going to see, you know, if they want to try to hand me a bunch of BS or anything. And I liked what I seen. I liked where I was at. So then that's when I got involved in combat of keto, which is much different than my uh, this traditional keto I've worked with before. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, we've had Grandmaster yeah. Pellegrini on the show. He, it was a, that was a fun episode. Oh, I bet it was. Yeah, I'm supposed to go to a seminar in uh, October, I think. Uh, I'm testing for third band, and uh, probably the instructor at the school I'm at says now, but once you reach that level, he likes to have hands-on work with you. So I, I guess when I get up there, he'll, he'll put me through some paces. With, like you said, it'd just be an honor just to shake his hand. You know? yeah. yeah, absolutely. Do you think that, that you know, I, I asked you where your kind of spark for martial arts came from and you know you didn't have a a specific answer but I'm, I'm going to guess just listen to your listening to your stories and talking about your father don't you think it came from him yeah i would guess if people ask me who has the most influence in my life it would definitely be him not only as my father but as my interest in martial arts i mean if you wanted to you know like i said rain dory you know grab a hold of him you know with boxing he's you know I would box with him, trust, you know, and that that was a mistake too. He could, he was just, it was just a natural, you know. And the, the few instances I know in his life where 
uh, he'd been attacked or somebody tried. He wasn't a big man. He was like five nine. But uh, you know, people made a mistake a couple of times of trying to get physical with him. And I, I, you know, I'd always laugh about it now and think, you know, boy, that's the biggest little man you ever grab a hold of. You know, but, but, uh, his, like I say, he, you know, he didn't. He was not training in boxing or training in martial arts or anything. Of course, he was raised on a farm with, you know, with five brothers. So uh, he was a younger. So you know, he probably been fighting since he could stand. You know. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, we hear a lot about people that start with, you know, let's just say, innate kind of fighting instinct from, you know, scrapping with their friends or. You know, unfortunately, for a lot of folks, it, it escalates beyond that and becomes something approaching serious, if not life or death. And their transition into formal martial arts doesn't always go well, you know, especially when there, when there are rules carved out. And, and it sounds like, in a sense, that your father could kind of be included in that group, you know, sticking his thumb in your eye. and yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, and my father used to say, uh, you know, he said, you know, son, I was raised in a completely different environment than most people. And I look back today and I find myself telling people, you know, I was raised in a different environment than people raised my kids or my grandkids been raised in. Uh, and back in, back in there in a, in a cold country, you know, it was pretty rough people, you know, and uh, some places are right or might made right, you know, and mm. was, you know, some of those they call them honky tonks, or you know, some bad places to be, you know. And uh, Dad was raised in, you know, you got to, you basically had to fight for everything you wanted. And uh, you know, just, I guess look back on it now, you see, which is a lot of ignorance from people. They thought that solved problems, but uh, Dad was managed to get out of that environment. He knew he could see it for what it was. And, and he's been trying to keep us out of it. Of course, there's always some. I, I, I'm going to talk hub keto class now, and I bet uh, the entire class there's not two people there that have ever been in a fight. You know, a real fight. Yeah. And you know, that's, you know, there's nothing ed- more educational than getting your hind end kicked. You know, uh, they, they don't understand a lot of the dynamics when you, you know, you're teaching the technique. You know, you're going to say, you know. This has got to happen now. This has got to be quick. You're learning something at an instructional pace, but you, you, something on art like up keto, you can't do it full speed. You're going to start crippling people up. But you, just, you know, you understand that when you execute this technique, you execute it now, fast. And they don't want, you know, they've never had been forced to work at that dynamic. So, you know, it, it's something you have to teach them. And, you know, if you, if you teach them their ground break falls well, you can maybe work at seventy percent of, of uh, full speed. You know, safely. If you know. how important is that? What's that for for general martial arts instruction? You know that that push towards reality because different styles and 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 even within styles, different schools draw those lines so dramatically differently. Yeah, and. Well, you get down to, you know, you've got competitive martial arts and, you know, what they call reality of martial arts. Uh, combat of keto, the way I understand, the way I understand Grandmaster Pellegrini, the, you're being trained for, the scenario is, I can't get out of this. I'm not going to talk my way out of this. Uh, I'm either attack is imminent or is in, I'm being attacked. You know, that's the scenario you're training for. <clears throat> and, you know, it's, it's gonna. It's probably gonna be over in 20 seconds. You hope it's over in 20 seconds, anyhow. And uh, where if you're teaching Taekwondo, and, there's, and I, I like Taekwondo, and it's you know it, it's as good as self defense. But a lot of it's it's more taught anymore as as, as com- competition, and and the self defense is is taught secondary. Uh, I don't see them pushing the reality of the scenario. You know, and I see it with kids. They try to be careful about what they teach kids because you don't want them hurting each other on the school ground. <clears throat> but, you know, I had <clears throat> just one student where I'm at uh, said to me, he says, how, was, was this hurt him real bad if I'd done this? And I looked at it, I said, I hope so. And that wasn't, that wasn't the, the answer she was expecting. 
you know, the bottom line here is the person who's hurt the less is the one who walks away. Uh, that's that's the reality. And uh, not to sound melodramatic, but I've told many students, it's okay to be civilized. We have to be civilized to participate in society. But don't let yourself become domesticated. You have got to be able to raise to the necessary level of violence to survive if you're attacked in some parking lot or in some street corner someplace. You have to get as, as mean and as nasty as, as necessary up to and, God forbid, lethal. If that's what it takes. You know, you look a guy in the eyes and one of us is going home in 30 seconds and one of us not. That's a motivating factor. And if it's, you know, you're scared, you're, you know, you're, you're terrified probably, but you've got to be able to raise to that level. And, you know, I've seen people who I don't think could possibly get there to that level. They're just, uh, I think if they were attacked, they just fall over. And you know, I don't mean that in a derogatory manner. We're all different. You know? I think that's, that's just, my father taught me one thing that was that, you know, you know, you know the, don't get down on the ground and kick you to death. You know, you say you might make a meal out of me, but I'm going to get a sandwich on my way to the ground. You know, I think a lot of us can intellectually wrap our brain around having to hurt someone, having to hurt someone badly, or or maybe even lethal, as you said. But obviously, the practice is so often different as really. Pretty much anybody that's ever been in a fight knows it's a complete disaster. I mean, it, it doesn't look like the movies. It's not pretty. It's not good. And and even if you win, you probably don't feel so great about it. Absolutely. And, and, you, know, the, you tell students, you know, they, they see these techniques on TV. They say, you know, nothing's going to look that pretty. You know, if it works at all, you're lucky. You can understand that, you know, the, this adversary is, you know, when, if you grab a hold of him, his first mistake is to get away. He's not going to sit there and let you execute anything. You know, street fighters are the worst people in the world to fight because if you're fighting another martial artist or something, you're in competition. You all basically get using the same techniques and you learn to you learn to read it. You see that lead foot pivot to the outside, you know, you know he's telegraphing the kick. You, know, you learn to read uh, people, your other martial artists, because you know their styles and you know the weaponry. You get against a street fighter. He's allowed to come up with anything and just coming from the wrong angles. You know, his, his kicks are you know, done. According to your training, absolutely done wrong. And, you know, you can't anticipate him. You know, you just don't know. You know, he stands flat footed and throws the old fashioned haymaker. You know, you didn't see that coming. You know, I could box with my dad. He could just sit there and look at your legs and box you. He could just read your legs that well. You can throw any punch you want to, and he, by watching your legs, he could block it. But uh, street fighters are just, they're just that hard, you know, they're going to come up with anything. You know? How do people wrap their brain around that? You know, you, you had a bit of a different upbringing. You came from a, a different time, as you said. How can someone, you know, I'm sure we've got a bunch of folks out there listening who maybe are three, five, seven years into martial arts. They probably started as an adult, and most of us, and I am absolutely in this group, had, you know, we didn't we didn't have to fight as children. We didn't have that that rugged upbringing that I think can make it easier to go there. How do we? Well, yeah, handle, we, how, do, how do we how do we deal with that? How do we become better at? looking somebody in the eye and saying one of us is going home and it's going to be me you know it's, we've tried to develop society into you never want to go there and that's been emphasized so much that you know the average person has been bred out for lack of a better term but unfortunately with our society is also a, a fairly violent society as far as crime goes. And, you know, so you're, you know, like I say, because be civilized, but don't be domesticated. And it's, you know, how do you teach somebody that? Uh, it's motivated by fear. You know, you have to, you know, the difference between a hero and a coward is both of them are terrified. One must be able to control the fear, and the other one wasn't. You know, it's, uh, if you've ever been in a fight, you've been scared, you've been hit. 
And, you know, that's another thing I tell students. So, you know, if you're in a fight, you're going to get hit. You're going to get kicked. If, God forbid if he's got a knife, you're probably going to get cut. You just got to depend on whether you're going to get cut on your arm or if you're going to get that thing buried in your, in your belly. But, you know, it's, it's a motivation. You know, I tell people, you know, I had a student doing ground fighting. She was on her back and she was about to give up. And I said, don't you dare give up. You never give up. You know, winners never lose and losers never win. You know, you, you, you're there, you're here for the, the duration, you know. Losing is not an option. You know, now I'm talking about training somebody for for street fighting, you know, not, not competition. You know, but it's hard. I don't know how you could teach somebody, you know, how do you teach somebody, to, you know, how to survive, a, you know, getting a high end kick without them getting a high end kick, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. sparring, will, sparring will take, you know, the, you know, the people who think they're tough guys and bullies can take martial arts, usually a couple of sparring classes, and they realize they're not the toughest guy on the block. I usually weed some out. You never see them last too long. <laughs> you know, they, they, they get in a spar against somebody as tough as they think they are, you know, and just not only whip them, but humiliate them. And then, you know, they said, just, you know, I'll go back out on the block and talk tough, you know. But it's, it's, it's hard to motivate people into rising to that level the only thing that, that'll do it is fear and so what you're doing in training it's like the military you know they, they train you to react a certain way in fear you depend on your training you know uh, so you hope that if god forbid this happens that they will instinctively through muscle memory and what i term i use when training is positional memory uh just react, and, and, and if their techniques are good enough, you know, hopefully they'll even surprise themselves on how fast it works, you know. But it's hard to motivate, you know, it's, it's just something that you can't just say, okay, you know, you're terrified. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, you can't just tap out of every scenario. And, yeah, that's it. there's and no tap on elements. You know, it's like mixed martial art. People ask me, you know, about that. I said, well, first of all, the mixed martial artist to me has got to be the best conditioned athlete in the world. If you doubt that, get out there on a the mat and just wrestle for two minutes. Yeah. You know, I've seen wrestlers when I was on wrestling. You know, I've seen them crawling off the mat with their lips blue, sucking for oxygen. You know, it, you know, and then to do when I first watched these guys do five minute rounds, I'm thinking I'm more impressed with their their endurance than I am with their their what's their fighting going on out there. Then you know, not only are they wrestling, but you got somebody you know pounding, grounding, and pounding. You know, just 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 amazing. But as tough as that is, you know, we teach ground fighting, and you know, you teach them how to lock the wrist and how to throw the guy, and and you know, and I'm telling people, look, if you're on top of me, first of all, I'm gonna put my thumbs in your eye, I'm gonna, you know, immediately, illegal in MMA. Right. I'm gonna slap you across the ears, illegal in MMA. I'm gonna punch you dead in the throat as hard as I can, illegal in MMA. You know, I'm going to grab you, a hair of your head and your chin, and I'm, you're either going to go off with me or I'm going to snap your damn neck. Get legal in MMA. So I got all the respect in the world for more MMA artists, and I don't want to tangle with any of them. But it's still different than surviving on the street. You know, you got, you know it's, it's nothing complicated. You know, you got to injure this person. You know, the old, you know, I'm sure you've heard the old thing if you can't walk, you can't fight. If you can't see, you can't fight. And if you can't breathe, you can't fight. You know, so, so what are we looking at? We're looking at eyes, throats, and knees. You know, I, I've actually not <laughs> heard that, but you know, I, I've heard one, you know, I, I've heard if you can't breathe, you can't fight. Um, I don't know, it's been articulated that. Simply again, you know, boiled off pretty well, and I think it does do a pretty good job of summing up ways that you know fights end. Yeah, you, uh, basically that's it. You know, you got to drop him, or he's going to drop you. And if you drop him, you don't want him getting up. You know, so you want to drop him fairly hard. That's you know, that's the thing about certain you know in, in arts where you're actually taking people to the ground you learn to do break fall so you don't get hurt hopefully you're never going to you're never going to fight with another martial artist it's ho- i hope society doesn't degenerate to that mm-hmm. so you're hoping 
you know, taking a guy to the ground is itself a technique, is itself a fight ending technique. If he hits the ground hard enough, either the wind's going to go out of him, or since he doesn't know how to fall, his head's going to bang off the ground. Hopefully, you know, normally if it's asphalt or cement, it's probably going to end right there. You know, it's when a lot of people just get in a fist fight and have accidentally been killed simply from where they because of the way they hit their ground. So, so you know, if you learn to, if you take your adversary to the ground quickly and efficiently, you know, I tell you know people you know, take them down. Drop, you know, if you in some techniques, as I take you to the ground, I'll drop to one knee myself, and that accelerates your velocity. You know, by a factor of ten. When you hit the ground, you're going to bounce. You know. Mm. So that, that in itself is just being a fight ending technique, just throwing them to the ground. But, uh, when you look at your martial arts experience, when your, your history and, and all the different tools you have in your toolbox, is there anything that you would want to add? I mean, whether that's training with a particular person or, or another style? Oh, uh, the art I'm working with right now, I love this. It's 99% there. I had to write a, uh, a book report, for lack of a better term, when I tested for second band to, for Master Pellegrini. It's just something he records. He wants your your opinion of his book. And uh, he also wanted a little history on me. And uh, I knew a little bit about him from what I've read. And uh, Aikido has some of the finest footwork. You know, and I actually work practice a little bit of that and have talked to other students about learning that as far as uh, moving around your adversary. I, I've noticed when training students for a move that requires them to turn, maybe grab a, an opponent and turn into him, but a lot of people, they have trouble with the turn. And then, you know, their feet get crossed. And uh, <clears throat> Akito has some basic... Uh, <clears throat> footwork, you know, seven or eight, I think they, there's like eight basic moves. And uh, they're really, I, I watch those, and, and I, one of the students at the class that I have to discuss this with, I'll, I'll, I'll tell her, I said, now you see when you've done that? You've done exactly a step and turn, uh, which is a uh, Aikido uh, foot move. Mm-hmm. So uh, I like the uh, the footwork and that the way they move. They, they, I told her I said, "Go home and, and practice." I said, "Then have your husband stand perfectly still, and then just move close to him. It helps you move." Uh, there's a technique where uh, you block a punch to you know, cross block to the inside, and then move step behind your adversary. And when I was first learning this technique, I would step and I would be, once I step behind him, I want to grab him by the head and, and take him down. I would step behind him and find that the distance wasn't right. I was a little bit too far from him when I stepped. I was stepping more at 11 o'clock than at 12, and I wasn't where I wanted to be. So I, from Aikido, there was a slide forward, which instead of stepping with my lead foot, I pushed off with my rear foot. And I was right where I wanted to be. I didn't. I didn't misdirection. You know, you know, half inch here is you know to put a foot out there. So there's a lot of good techniques in there. Uh, the judo training I had 50 years ago. Still, the the core of that and balance disruption and close quarter moving has stayed with me more than and not, not to mention the break calls. Uh, uh, I've probably done a million break calls. But the, the Taekwondo, of course, the, the kicks, or, you know, the distance there is a different dynamic. But you, uh, one school was that, you know, I talked the instructor into uh, I've taken a keto there. I said, won't you let us spar with your Taekwondo class? And uh, the people who had no Taekwondo background at all, they gave a little basic class and, you know, front kick, side kick, that kind of basics of Taekwondo. And we would spar with the Taekwondo people. Of course, you'd get up against a fifth damn black belt in Taekwondo. It's going to be one of the most educational high end kickings you ever had, you know. But it was great for, it was just a win-win situation. The uh, 
Taekwondo people were not used to having people crowd them. And we were, you know, we were in an enclosed art and they're not. So, you know, like it goes back to what I said about distance. You know, they had to, they had to analyze and, you know, and adjust and overcome the same as we did. And I knew if I stayed at a distance away from this Taekwondo guy, I'm in the world of crap because of, you know, I'm, I'm in his, I'm at his house now. So uh, we were learning a lot about distance. Of course, sparring and Taekwondo is, you know, you, I would caught myself a couple of times wanting to do a foot sweep or a takedown, which is, you know, that's not that art. So you have to play by the house rules. Yeah. Well, when in Rome, as we say on the when show. In Rome, yeah. And uh, learning the difference, you know, you learn to uh, to adapt. Uh, uh, you know, it's just like the basics. You know, you can do <clears throat> try, you know, try a wheel kick in a phone booth sometimes. You know, you got to you got to work with your environment. You know. Right. Uh, so you know, as, as people close in on you on a street fight, you know, you know, it's not television. You know, the, the first technique you execute is not going to be a wheel kick. I don't care. You know, as much as I love Chuck Norris's martial arts background and respect him immensely, you know, he has to do what the you know what the television people want him to do. You know, you would never you know that's telegraphed. You know. The people in the next county can see that coming, you know. So, you know, you learn to, to work, you know, what techniques work under what circumstances. And when you close with somebody, the, the weapons change. Like I say, from foot kicks, and, you know, you're into knees and elbows and finger gouging and whatever comes else comes up along, you know. You've got some good stories. We've heard quite a few. One of my favorite pieces of this show is it gives me the opportunity to ask people point blank for the great stories that they have so I'm wondering is there some favorite story of yours from your time in the martial arts that you'd be willing to share well I told you one about my dad knocking me out in the red yeah, door. Which, which is pretty good story <laughs> one, of the, one of the first I remember uh, I was probably 10 or 11 maybe 13. I was at a roller skating ring in Fairmont, West Virginia, and a fight broke out. And these people were much older than I And I recognized one of the guys, a black guy named Willie Paul. He was from the same mining camp that I lived in. He was about 6'6". Six, six. Willie was probably at least 10 years older than I was. And this guy started a fight with him. I, I can see it as clear as today. He had on a white shirt and black slacks. And Willie Paul front kicked this guy right square in the face and dropped him in the fight. And so I'm, I'm watching this, and then I realized this guy's wearing roller skates. So I didn't know whether to be more impressed with his skating ability or his martial arts ability. I mean, try a front kick, a high front kick while you're wearing roller skates sometimes, you know. And uh, I found out later that he was in the army, and you know he was overseas studying that karate stuff. You know, so, but uh, that, was, that, was, that always left a lifelong impression on me. I, I could still see him execute that. But that, you know, like I say, you know, different environment. You know, you can go to skating ring the rest of your life and never see a fight. Hopefully, you know, we've evolved a, a higher than that. But did you ever try it? Well. I mean, my eye wasn't that good of a roller skate. I mean, that, would, that would have just been an exercise in break falls for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to guess there aren't too many people that good at roller skating. I mean, the moment the moment that foot comes up above the waist, your your trajectory changes quite a bit. Yeah, you know, I, I watch you know like everybody. I watch skating, ice skating, roller skating, and it seems like the, the professionals have a way of locking that heel down or the toe down or they got a block or a chalk or something on the back of their skate to stabilize them but like you say once that especially when it goes like you say above your waist you know i'd be you know i'd be lucky to execute a snap kick to your shin and get away with it you know on roller skates you know but, uh, yeah definitely not my uh preferred method of locomotion if i'm going to get in a fight yeah, and you know that was a skating ring, and you know, like I say, you get so you know, there's an old joke about a West Virginia bar. You know, a guy goes into a bar in West Virginia, and the bartender says, "You carrying a gun or a knife?" And the guy says, "No." So the bartender gives him one. You know, that's a tough bar. You know, 
<laughs> that's the kind of environment there was. And, you know, you get you see these fights break out in these places. I used to hate it if there was a pool table because there's always some yo-yo going to start throwing them damn balls, you know. And, you know. All you could do is grab a chair and pull over your head and hide in a corner, you know. And there's a guy I worked in the coal mines with. <clears throat> some people come up and uh, I think his son lived across the street. And so his son was having trouble with some some people, and they come up there when his son wasn't home, busted the window out of his house or something. And they told Frank about it. I said, Frank, that those people right down there at the bottom of the hill down there, that bar down there shooting pools. Yes, I seen see them go. So this guy who I, I, I knew him and his son, and he was nobody to mess with. He goes down to that bar, walks in there. There's two guys shooting pool. Frank picks a cue stick up off the rack and puts both of them in University Hospital. You know, you, you know, the heavy end of a cue stick is a lethal weapon, you know. The only problem was them two guys are left, and these are two other guys shooting pool. So he actually put them in. He actually was working on the wrong two people, you know. And I guess, you know, the rest of his life, he worked for the lawyers, you know. But that's just the type of environment. That, I knew where that bar was at. I never went into that place, you know. My father-in-law asked me about it one time, and I said, he said, you ever been in there? I said, I'll tell you what, buddy. Anytime you think you're overdue for a thorough butt kick and just go on in there, those guys will catch you up in a hurry. Yeah. But, uh, you know, you get in the, in the real life environments, where, you know, it, it's, it's not all the clean fist fights and stuff. People are throwing stuff, bottles, cue sticks, cue balls, whatever. You know, you, you're just hiding under a table hoping you're not hit by shrapnel, you know. Do you think that? external experience that context for combat non-martial arts combat do you think that makes you a better martial artist because you understand fighting the way it really is better or do you think it makes you a more challenged martial artist because you're looking at things that are i'm suspecting are presented to you from a narrower perspective I think what would work and etc I think it makes me a better martial artist because what you said what will work I see techniques taught that I've been you know I say okay if you want me to learn that I'll learn it but that will never work in the real world you know a lot of them take too much of an assumption that the, your, your adversary is going to react in a certain way and in real life it don't work that way uh, you go to lock somebody's arm up. The minute that motion starts, he's start he gonna start restricting that arm. So you know that's the emphasis on the speed and you know just a simple arm bar. If not you know uh, people say, well, there's a you know there's a counter for an arm bar. If I reach up and grab your hand, I can do this or that. And then you know you say you want to learn this, and I say, oh, I'll learn that. But you know that's you know you're not you're you're watching too much television. You know, an arm bar, it's, it's not a hold. It's a technique used to get you from point A, standing to point B on your face. You know, we don't stop it halfway and holding you. It's not a, it's not a hold. So it's, it's, and a lot of times I see that's, that's taught that way, you know, to hold them, you know, with, with them bent over at the waist. Well, any Taekwondo guy is going to side kick your knee and break your knee if, you know, if this is a street situation. So, uh, yeah, you, you see techniques and you say, now that, that's, I can't see that work. Of course, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not Master Pellegrini either. So, you know, based on the experience and the background that I have, I see some, and I, and I think that, you know, the, the few older cases that I've been in, uh, as I was raised, and uh, having my eye gals by my dad a few times, taught me uh, a little bit about what really will work and what won't, you know. Uh, like I say, the judo balance disruption helps more than anything else. So, you know, if a guy, you know, if you're going to try to take a guy off his feet, whether it's a, a sweep, a reap, a, a lock, a throw, or whatever you're executing, it's probably not going to work if you don't control his balance. You know, you're not going to take a guy standing flat-footed and throw him to the ground. That's such extremely hard to do. And uh, people, that's why people try things they see on TV that doesn't work. They, they see the big reap. Uh, you always see the moment where the guy steps to the outside and sweeps the guy's foot. That's called Osoto Gary in judo or 
outside major outer reaping is, is what that's called. Everybody sees, you know, I actually talked to them and said, okay, what did I just do? And everybody says, well, you kicked these legs off from me. You, you, you reaped that leg. Yeah, what else did I do? And they all look at me. Nobody seen my hand shift or the way I stepped that just roughed his balance and put all his weight on that foot. Mm-hmm. The one I reaped is what's called the target, the target leg. It's so subtle that unless you know what you're looking for, you don't see it. In Hapkido, we have what's called the Hapkido finger. I don't know if you've ever seen that. It's your index finger. You do a technique and you keep your index finger pointing so they can actually see the direction that you're, the way you're turning your wrist. Because a lot of it is just so subtle that you can't, it's hard, unless you I do it on you, you won't even know what's going on. But you can see which way I'm actually turning my wrist. And whether a technique works or doesn't work, it can be just that subtle, right? you know, just an outside wrist lock. I've got people put outside wrist lock, I'm going to stand there and look at them. Because I said, now, move your hand and point behind me. And they would do that, and boom, I'm down. You know, it's just uh, the direction of the, you know, uh, of the pressure. Yeah. Yeah, that, that finger point is something that I've used to demonstrate various wrist locks and everything because it especially for beginners can really help them focus on yeah, the movement I, absolutely it's, it's an excellent instruction and i even have them do it themselves you know i had a student the other day trying to take somebody down and said why isn't this working i said where's your finger pointing she says to that wall i said well, you're not trying to try him backwards i said do it again and this time your finger should be pointing where you want him to to end up. So if you want him on your back, on your feet, that's where your finger should be pointing with the end of this technique. So she executes the technique, rolls her hand further, the lock tightens and the guy goes down. So mm-hmm. you normally want you normally want him at your feet. That way you can finish it. If I threw him across the room, he's just going to come back up and we're going to have to re-engage again. I don't want that. I want him on the ground. I want this over with. I want to be able to finish him when he hits the ground. If the pole doesn't knock him out, then I will. You know, but We're going to end this thing, you know. Now, you mentioned that you're preparing for an upcoming testing, but beyond that, you know, I'm not getting any sense that you're you're planning to stop training or, or even slow down. So I'll ask you the question I ask nearly all of our guests. Why? What are your goals? What's got you continued motivation as you look at your training? Uh. It's just a love of martial arts, you know. I, I played golf before, never was any good at it, you know. Uh, I've done other sports, uh, martial arts, you know. It's like I said, but I was out of it for a few years and got back in it. Uh, my dad was alive. He said, "Well, I said, well, I'm going back to martial arts. You know, it's something I've always loved." He says, "Yeah, you have always, always been interested in that, you know." And uh, at my age, you know, I'm 67. I got to, I find as long as I keep moving, if I don't want to rust up like an old can, you know. So uh, when I, now when I put my hands, when I bend over and put my hands on the on the mat to stretch, you know, it sounds like a box of Rice Krispies snap, pack, crackle, I'm popping. But, but, you know, it feels pretty good when it's over. You know? <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's just the love of the martial arts. You know, I can't, I'll be third down and then, you know, that means I'll be, if I, you know, if the Lord gives me the years to test for another, again, I'll be 70 years old when I test for the next one, but, you know, I'll be there, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly decent physical condition now, you know, I got lung problems, so I've had pneumonia a couple of times to get some uh, black lung from them working into coal mines, but. I don't, you know, I'm not out there sparring in Taekwondo. You know, Taekwondo to me is a young man's sport. You know, that's, Taekwondo is an art where they say the senior division starts at 30 years old. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I could see that. I could see that. That yeah, yeah. I was actually just talking to a friend of mine um, who recently attended an AAU Taekwondo tournament, and he was the only adult male black belt. Is that right? Yeah. This was not a... <laughs> and, and he told me how many people had attended. It was, it was something like 400 competitors. Wow. And I think there he was the only adult male, and there were three adult women. Wow. Well, they have a tournament here. We, we talk about big tournaments. They have one in, I think they do it in Lexington. We call it Bluegrass Games. I, I've never actually went down there. We had people from 
taekwondo students from uh, the school I'm at now that uh, have competed down there. But uh, there's only one or two adults that I know that even compete down there. Uh, it's kind of funny. Maybe it's, it's in my blood. I got a, a, a cousin in the uh, Charleston area, West Virginia. He's a second Dan Black Belt. He's older than me. Uh, I got another cousin in, in uh, Parkersburg who's a fifth Dan master. Uh, his sister in uh, Warren, Ohio is a second Dan. Now, we didn't all say, hey, you know, let's, let's just talk martial arts. We all done this independently of each other. You know, I, I studied and somebody said, you know, Rick studies that. I said, really? I didn't know that. You know, of course, when we reconnected as adults, we find this out. Uh, when I went to see my first combat up keto class, like I said, just to evaluate it, see if this is what I want. My daughter uh, was studying Wilson TV. I said, I'm going to go to martial arts class. You want to go along? And she said, yeah. I tell everybody that. I created a monster. She wanted to know, can I take it with you? I said, sure. You know, she's my youngest, so you know, I wanted to have some memories of you know, public daughter type stuff with her. So we started Take a combat of keto together. You know, put on a white pellet. You know, she did. She was starting to ground up. And uh, they talked her also into uh, getting into Taekwondo. So, in a two, two, three year period, she made black belt in combat of keto, received her first band in Taekwondo. And also got her master's degree in criminal justice, all within the all during the same time. She would be taking seven martial arts classes a week. Uh, the, the senior instructor said, "I show up at the school, and she's standing in the front door, patting her foot. You know, get it open. You know, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, you know, she, she's and she's very good. But she's very good at both arts. She's, you know, she, would, she didn't like working with women in combat of keto. She, she wanted to work with a man. She said, ain't a woman going to attack me on the street. Well, I'm attacking me by a man. And she, she just threw a perennial kick to your to your thigh and drop you on an instant. She had it down to an art. And uh, she took ground fighting classes. And it was just, you know, I'll get on Facebook and I'll talk to sick of this, believe it or not, that I don't know. <laughs> and uh, I found, you know, it's amazing the, the number of them that are in martial arts. There's, there's one is like a fourth day in, in a Japanese style huh. in Ohio also. And I've seen one on Facebook t- testing for his fifth day somewhere in Michigan. And I actually wrote a book on the family genealogy and had it published back in 1990. And uh, there's a whole bunch of them in Oklahoma I didn't even know about, you know. Maybe you need an addendum <laughs> specifically for those people in your family tree that are martial artists. Yeah. Because it sounds yeah. like there's something there. There's something, whether it's, you know, something cultural that was handed down or, I mean, heck, maybe maybe martial, love for martial arts is genetic and we haven't isolated yeah, what that gene is yet. Me and my cousin always laugh and say, hey, they're probably just such, you know, buttholes that somebody has to kick their hind end every once in a while. I said, well, you know, that's always a possibility, too, you know. Hmm. If folks listening, you know, they want to get a hold of you, or are you are you on social media at all, or email, or, you know, I... Yeah, I'm at... Tell uh, some good stories, and, and I've got I'm, a feeling on, some people might want to reach out. Okay. I'm, I'm on Facebook, and... Uh, I got an email, which is the first four letters of my last name, Zick, at Fuse, F-U-S-E, dot net, which is Cincinnati Bill product. And uh, I've had that email address forever because I didn't realize it's there. But I give people my email address, and they say, man, that's cool. That's neat. I'm thinking, what are you talking about? And then I filled out a form one time, and I had to write my email, Zick at Fuse. And then below it, I signed my name, and I signed Zikafus. I said, hey, that's cool. It looks the oh. same. <laughs> I know. I get I it. I didn't yeah. Get it. I, these people talking about, oh, that's neat. I'm thinking, what in the world are you talking about? You know? But so, you know, a lot of them, all my friends now remember my email that way. That is an easy it, one. But, of course, it, anybody listening, if you aren't going to remember that or you want to check out anything else that we've talked about today, we'll have the show notes over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. So if you're driving or something, we don't want you to crash. 
Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. You know, th- I'm all, is, let me put a plug in also please. for uh, Karate Town USA, uh, Florence, Kentucky. That's where I work out now. Uh, run by Alan and Sandy Gates, who are great people. They teach ta- a good Taekwondo class there, and they teach uh, combat of Kido. Oh, great. And and I believe you dropped that in the form that you sent in, so we'll make sure that we link that at the show notes. Okay. Too. So appreciate it. Somebody's traveling through, maybe they can drop by and take a class and yeah. and see the place that you've chosen to train. I think that's one thing that a lot of people don't realize. Those of us that have trained in a number of different schools, we don't just tend to end up at whatever's closest. We tend to be kind of picky. I'm going to guess that you're in that camp, too. Yeah, if it's not a good, not a good program, you, you're doing yourself a disservice. This has been a lot of fun, and we always ask our guests to wrap up the show with some parting words. So what advice would you give to the folks listening? Well, if you're training in martial arts, decide why you want to take martial arts. You think, do you want to compete? Uh, do you want to hear emphasis on self-defense, survival, surviving on the street? Then you, you need to uh, decide what you want out of martial arts and uh, if you before you decide on where to go or what art and then you know if it's not what you want don't be afraid to quit and go get what you want uh, it's not going to be easy uh, like I say to be a real a will around a martial art it's, you're going to you're going to be involved in more than one art because of the, the things I've mentioned about distance you got you got to you got to address all the distances but train hard and, and train safe wow thank you mr sikafus for sharing your story with us It's such an honor that you'd open the door to your journey, and I'm sure that I'm not the only one to take inspiration from it. I admire your dedication to the martial arts, as well as your admiration for your father. Again, thank you for coming on the show. For those of you listening, head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check out the show notes, sign up for the newsletter, check out other episodes, maybe leave a comment. What did you think about this episode? You can also do that via social media including YouTube. We are at Whistlekick everywhere. Or if you want to share something privately, go ahead. You can email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. We're always looking for great guest suggestions, topics for our Thursday shows. And really, I just want to know what you think. That's all I've got for you today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.